that happens, yeah. So I'll turn it on, as, as, as we turn it on, we'll review those components. Now, they, they, all, um, they all have their own distinct uses, uh, and uh, most of them are pretty obvious, you know, a text box for a single line of text, a, a text area for multiple lines of text, a, um, a, a uh, drop down or radio buttons for when you have a set of mutually exclusive um, conditions. All right. Um, there we go. A um, checkbox where you have a, a, a yes or no question or a set of yes or no questions. Again, the one thing I did mention last time and I want to reiterate is you actually can tweak a drop down to work more like checkboxes, that is allow multiple selections. That being said, that's something I would rarely do um, because people typically aren't aware of that. People are kind of confused if a, if a drop down behaves that way. So for the most part, you know, I mentioned that, you can look it up if you have a need to, but typically I would say checkboxes are probably the better way to go if you truly have a, a list of not exclusive options. All right, let's go, let's go over, um, we said when to use a checkbox versus a drop down or radio button. When would you use a drop down versus a set of radio buttons? Drop down, no, go ahead. Right. Okay. So that's when you do is a drop down instead of radio buttons. Okay. What were you going to add to that? Okay. All right. All right. Exactly. Both both answers said the same thing. The first answer says, for example, if you were picking states uh, of the United States, a, a list of states, there's 50 states. So you would use a drop down for that simply because the real estate that it would take up on the screen would be less than uh, f than for to have 50 radio buttons. So generally speaking, it's a radio button issue. The radio buttons have the advantage of you can see all the options at once. The drop down has the advantage that it takes up less space on the screen. So that generally is the deciding factor between the two uh, is how many of them that you have. Um, all right, let's go on. I think, we, I think we've done enough preamble. Let's go on and let's make a form. Now, in order to make a form, we have to have a server-side script to submit to. And again, we don't study that in class. So I'm going to use a server-side script supplied to us by our friends Microsoft because we know that Bill Gates really cares for us and he is interested in our best interests. So we'll go in and we'll use something he created. And what we're going to do is we're going to sort of tap into and use the scripts associated with the with the Bing search engine. I used to use Google for this, but Google changed some things around and it doesn't work like it used to. And I'm going to do a query in Bing, and we're going to look at it, and we're going to do a little bit of reverse engineering to understand what we need to do here. All right. Let's do a search for HTML5. All right. What I want to look at is going and it's doing its thing and it's returning the results eventually. All right. What I want to look at is this URL up here. All right. This is what we're going to use to sort of reverse engineer and figure out how we need to create our form to use 
the server side script on the the Bing end of things to um, to display the proper results. It's clear again that this requires a server side script, right? You know, they have no idea what I'm going to type in that search box, so they couldn't possibly have a bunch of a, a bunch of of results page out there waiting like they do at McDonald's, having a bunch of sandwiches there waiting for someone to ask for them. All right, this page was created on the fly just for me based on what I typed in. If I typed in something else, it would give me a different set of results. So it's clear that this was made custom for me. If I come back tomorrow and people have added new pages about HTML5, I'm liable to see my results change. All right, and so on. So how does the server know that I did a search for HTML5 as opposed to XHTML? All right, the form tells it that. How does the form tell it that? Let's look at the URL that gets called. Notice, up to this point is a, sort of a basic URL. You know, URL, Universal Resource Locator, um, you know, is, is the web page's um, address, if you will. Notice that after the word search, there's a question mark. All right. The question mark means something special. The question mark is the start of what is called the query string. All right. The query string is where we can pass information to a server-side script. <coughs> There's a couple of ways we can do it. The query string is one of the ways that we can do it. Now notice, look very closely, it says Q equals HTML5. Well, that's the very words that I typed in that text box. So the words on my text box got put on the query string um, with the label of Q. So Q equals HTML5. If we look at the rest of the query string, there's a couple of other things there that I frankly don't know what they are. But they're not important. All right? They're not important to our discussion here. This is the one that we're, import, uh, that, that we're interested in. Notice the question mark starts the, the query string. Each entry on the query string is separated by an ampersand. All right. Some of you may remember if you had an ampersand in your uh, code that you had to change it to dollar sign amp. Well, an ampersand is a special character in XHTML, and that's why you had to do it. So the ampersand here separates the different pieces of the query string. We're only interested in this piece. And to prove you that this still works, I'll go and I'll open another tab. And I'll go in. And if I just put that URL in, I still get my results. My results for HTML5. So that's all I need to do is somehow put on the URL um, Q equals whatever I want to search for. So let's build a form to do just that. All right. So I'm going to go in. I'm going to keep that open. I'm going to go in and I'm going to copy this guy to say form. And we'll go and change this. And we'll start out with no CSS. Just so that we can um, focus on just the form stuff. And I'll go here and we'll worry about styling forms later on. Let's first just get the make one. All right. Now, first of all, I'm going to start out with the form tag itself. The form tag goes around all the controls that we want to send to the server at the same time. All right. So for example, uh, a login form. 
All right, an angel. There's a, a user ID. There's a password. There's a submit button. All right. All three of those things are in the same form tag. All right. If you go into, let's say, Amazon and you want to create a new account. You have to give your first name, last name, address, city, state, zip, other information. There might be a dozen or so text boxes that you fill in, maybe a drop down for state and, and other things. All 12 or however many of those fields are in one form. It's possible to have more than one form on a page, but it's not real common. All right. What I've seen is I've seen pages where it says if you're an existing account, log in. If you're a new account, fill out this information. That's probably two forms. There's a form for log in that does one thing. There's a form that creates a new account that does something else. So again, think of the form as being the envelope and you're putting everything that you want to put in that envelope to send to the server you put in the form tag. So I'm going to go and create the form tag. And the form tag has two attributes to it. This one for now, just trust me. We'll probably talk a little bit more about it later, but just trust me. In effect, what this does is this says, hey, I want to pass the data on the query string. There's two ways to pass the data via the query string and another way. And by saying method equals get, we're passing our data on the query string. Okay? Then we have the action of the form. And the action of the form is the name of the script on the server that we're running that we want to call. So this is going to be the name of the script on the server that we want to call. Well, in this case, what is the name of the script on the server we want to call? everything before the question mark. So, so, what this form tag says is, I have a bunch of fields that I want to send to the server. All right, whatever I put between the start and end form tag, I'm going to send that to the server. All right, I'm going to send it on the query string. That's what the method of get means, which is what we want to do, right? Because when we looked at Microsoft's example, when we looked at, at the example from the Bing search engine, that's how it did it. it. It passed the relevant fields on the query string. Then finally, what is the name of the script that we want to call? Well, again, I got that from the URL, everything up to the query string. The query string is going to be formed by my fields that I've gone and, and typed in. All right, so that's my basic form tag. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a, a I'm just going to put some text that says enter search term. This actually won't get sent to the server, right? Because it's just some plain text. You know, there, there's just different. You know, only the, the, the form controls, which we've defined before, actually get sent to the server. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say input type equals text, name equals Q. Now, where do you suppose I came up with the name equals Q? Yeah, on the query string. In other words, I know that this is what the query string needs to look like. All right. So, how do I make it look like that? Well, if I give this text box a name of Q, then it's going to the value of this will appear on the query string as Q equals whatever I've typed in that text box. So, by getting the name of the text box to match the name that the server side script is expecting. That's how I can hook up my form to a server-side script. All right. There are other attributes I could put in, but we'll not worry about those right now. This is enough. Oddly enough, 
the input tag is also used for the submit button. The input tag is used for some, but not all, of the form controls. All right. So radio buttons, text boxes, all three different kinds of buttons, text boxes, check boxes, radio buttons, and the other kind of buttons. All those are accomplished via the input tag. Uh, drop downs and text areas have their own um, have their own uh, form control. Name equals button submit. Now, by virtue of making this a submit button, its action, its default action, is going to be when this button gets clicked, I'm going to call this server side script and I'm going to pass all the form controls on the query string to that script. So let's go and let's look at my form and see how my form hooks up to the server side script. So I'll go and I'll save this. We'll keep this open but there. All right. There's my text. Again, that won't get sent to the server because it's really not, it's just a label. It doesn't really serve, uh, doesn't, is really of no importance to the, to the server. Here's my text box to enter the data in. Here's my submit button. Ah, one thing I forgot to do on the submit button is I can give the submit button a value. And the value is going to be whatever words I want to display in the button. So I didn't put anything in so it says submit query. Well that doesn't sound really user friendly so I'm going to go and save it and now it says search Bing. All right. So let's go in and I'll go and put my HTML5 in here and do my search and there we go. My form called the server-side script for Bing and um, passed, uh, passed the data on the query string. And because I made the query string look enough like the one that it expects, it worked. All right? Now they allow you to do this. They would encourage you. You could like incorporate this on your own site, right? You know, so you could have a, a page that would say, you know, or a form that says, here, search Bing for information. And you could customize the search or whatever. So, I mean, it's not like, you know, I am somehow secretly sneaking in and using that script. I mean, they welcome this sort of use of it. So, all right. Now, let's look at this query string a little closer. And you'll notice, which one? This one. You'll notice, what do you see? That's the action of the form, right? That matches up exactly with the action that I defined on the form. Why? Because when you press the submit button, that action gets called. All right. The get says that the values of the form are going to be on the query string. All right. Well, they are. Q equals HTML. In addition, btn submit equals search Bing. It actually also sends the value of the search button. Of, of, I'm sorry, the submit button. This is useful um, if you have a form with a couple of buttons on it, right? You may have, for example, you know, um, on a page, change a line item on your order, you know, maybe change the quantity of it, um, change the gift wrapped option, whatever, or delete the item. So it may actually be two buttons on a form. All right, this one is pretty straightforward. We only have one button, but it's possible to have two buttons. Well, the button that got clicked, that will be sent on the query string along with the rest of the data. That way the server-side script can look and say, hey, did they press the change button or the delete button? All right, 
So when you see a button on the, on the, the URL, that's an indication, hey, that's the button that got clicked. Now in this case, that script wasn't expecting the name of my button, but it wasn't bothered by it either. You know, I passed those extra things on the query string. It, it was, it just ignored them. All right. Any questions about this? Again, notice whatever the name is, along with the value, gets put on the query string. You can't name it anything other than Q. I can't name that anything other than Q. In fact, let's go in and, and name it something else and see what happens. All right, now I search for HTML5. I, I, I clicked on it new. I, I opened it again. I didn't need to refresh it. Now notice what happens. All right. All right, I go and click on this. Bing doesn't know what to do with my request, so it sends them back to the home page. Why? Because I sent on the query string some garbage. I didn't send what it was expecting. And we can see that for ourselves if I go in, cut and paste this URL in there. Watch what happens if I manually go and put that URL in there does the same thing. It looks at that and says, hey, they didn't search for anything. I can't search the entire internet then and just display every website out there, so I'm going to direct them to the, the page to, to allow them to re-enter re their search term. Now, normally, you or someone in your organization is writing both the HTML to enter the form and the server-side code to process the form, right? So normally, it's you that's making up that, that name, all right? So you know that your server-side script's expecting Q or X or, or username or whatever, all right? Or if it's not you yourself, it's someone else within your organization. So you go, hey, Charlie, what did you call the name field? And Charlie says, I called it txt name, and okay, I'll put txt name. If you look in your form assignment, I've given you the names that you need to call when you call that script. If you don't call the fields by that names, it's not going to work. By those names, it's not going to work. All right? So again, either you're doing it yourself or you're doing it as part of a team. It's only in a case like this where I'm using a script um, server-side script to do a search, or you could do a similar thing with probably MapQuest or mapping software. I've seen uh, uh, pages do that. Um, only then uh, do you have to go and like look at the URL and sort of reverse engineer to figure out um, what you're going to search for. All right? Is the name case sensitive? Great question. I honestly don't know. Let's test it out. This case it wasn't. I would not swear that every web server slash um, server-side scripting language it wouldn't be an issue with. For example, just as a general rule, uh, Microsoft uh, solutions tend not to be case sensitive. If you look, for example, like the name of a file, um, you can't have a file named lowercase x.txt and uppercase x.txt. It thinks it's the same file in Windows. In Unix, however, you can. So I would think that Unix-based platforms like Apache web servers, uh, PHP and all that, it probably would be case sensitive. But that's just a guess. I don't tempt fate. <laughs> I'll just match the case, right? It just saves you headaches later. 
All right. So that's one form to do that. Let's go and what do I want to do? Is there an advanced search anywhere? Yeah, under my rewards. My reward is I can't do the advanced search. All right. Let's go and let's refine our search and let's look for only things that match that are in English. Now, it looks like that's an EN. So I'm going to try this. I'm going to put a text box in here. For language, name equals language, so that I can go in and I can type a language. And let's see if this works. I honestly have to say I'm not sure if this will work or not. So let's look for HTML5, but only look for things in English. All right. That seemed to work. Let's try another language. Let's try looking for things in Icelandic. All right. There we go. All right. They use the language of IS for Icelandic. So let's go and let's try our form. Yeah, didn't quite work. All right, my reverse engineering isn't right on that. Shoot. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's not doing it exactly the way that I was expecting. Oh, well. I guess, I guess we have to skip that part and go to another, another thing. All right. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to give a second, a, a second way to search. One way to search is via text box, all right, which is probably the logical way to search, right? But let's say if we wanted to, well, do like Bing's engine does. Notice when I call up Bing, if I sit there and wait a minute, or in fact, even if I don't, oh, there we go, it shows a list of popular searches. And I can pick those from a drop down. So, for example, isn't Jaleel White Urkel? Yeah. I'm. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So I could search for that. And there we go. So that's a different way to search. All right. So let's figure out how we could do that on our page. And I'm not going to make a separate page just for convenience, but this could very well be a separate page. I'm going to make a separate form. All right. So I'll put another form on here. And I will put, this time I want to put a drop down. All right. Now a drop down is a different tag than uh, input. All right, it's a different tag. It is actually done via a select tag
and a list of options. All right. Let's say I want to have my own list of frequently searched items or something like that. All right. I can put an option opening day. I can put another option for HTML5. Maybe another one for CSS3. All right, let's notice what I did here. My select goes around my options. So this is almost like a list, right, where you have a UL, an unordered list, and inside the UL you have an LI for list item or an ordered list. Your select really is a list of options, all right? Now, why would you use a drop down again instead of a text, term, uh, a text box? Maybe not, forget about this case for a second, but just in general terms, we mentioned earlier use it for state. Uh, it, it was mentioned. Why might we use a drop down for state instead of using a text box? Yeah. So people can't type in something. Right, so, so you, you limit the, the selections that people can make, right? So, you know, there's only 50 states, so, um, you know, you don't want someone typing in, you know, uh, state of confusion, all right? You want them to pick one of the, you know, that may be a valid state, not in a geographical sense is it valid. So you would, you would want to limit them to the list of legal options. In addition to that, the other thing that becomes important is especially when we start hooking these forms to databases, all right, there's an issue of consistency. In other words, if someone were to type in Ohio, all right, one person could type in Ohio, one person could type in the abbreviation OH, another person could type in O, capital OH, another person lowercase OH, uh, someone could typo and type in Ohio and add a couple extra O's on the end if they, they hit the key too hard or whatever. The point is, is if you do that then, you're getting data that's kind of hard to group together correctly, right? Um, so what you typically do in a database is, is you know, you create tables and you, you want to ensure a consistent way. So I don't have to look to see, gee, you know, if their state is OH or their state is the word Ohio, that really means the same thing, Ohio. I just can ensure consistency. So um, I can ensure consistency by giving a drop down. That way I know anyone that picks Ohio, I know the value I'm giving it. Now, let's look closer at this option, or at these options. Each one of them has a value and then has some text between the start and end option tag. All right? The purpose of that is very often um, the value that your database requires or that your application requires may be different than the way the user would understand it, all right? For example, you know, um, what, is the, what is the four letter abbreviation here at LC for marketing? Don't look it up. What is it? Pardon me? MRKT? Yeah, you'd think that would be a good one, but it's not. No, that's business administration. That would be a good one. 
It's actually the least, least logical option of anything that people have said. Every one that you've said is a better one. It's actually M, M, K, R, G. Which if you think, that inverts the R and the K, you know, if you're taking it as an abbreviation. Yeah, I have a feeling someone messed it up and it just continued to do that forever. Uh, by the way, as a footnote, I was, I was uh, in Oberlin the other day and I looked across the street and I saw a little plaque on a building and it was uh, the, the place where the guy that founded Alcoa first like figured out how to do something with aluminum. I don't remember what. But it also explains why people in the United States and people in the UK pronounce aluminum different. How do people in the UK say aluminum? Aluminium. Aluminium, right. Why do we say aluminum? Well, because we're Americans, right? <laughs> no, why do we, what, what's the difference? It was actually misspelled on the patent application. All right, so they misspelled it on the, on the a patent application. So the, the American spelling and pronunciation is one thing and the UK spelling is, and pronunciation is, is something else. So, well, you know, by, by now it's kind of a moot point, right? But the original, the, the, the U.S. spelling was the misspelling of the common term that was used at the time. Uh, I think there's an extra I in there. Because there's even an extra... Yeah. Right. Right. All right. Excellent. So, anyhow... The bottom line is, none of us in here, including myself, who teaches a marketing class, all right, believe it or not, I teach social media marketing, and throughout the entire first semester I taught this class, I had the abbreviation wrong. I put MRKG, which made more sense to me. Then at some point I realized, wait a minute, it's MKRG. The point is, is people don't know the values of, co of codes, right? Our internal database and our internal applications, if you want to select marketing, you better pick MKRG. But you know what? Most people don't know what MKRG is. That would be very confusing to them. All right? As a result, what do you want to do? You want to put it in terms that the person can understand. So if I was doing an option for that on, let's say, the search on LC site or the course search, I would do this, marketing, and the value would be MKRG. Why do I do that? I do that because this is what people are going to recognize. This is what my typical user is going to recognize. This is what the system needs. This is what the database needs, or the application needs, or the search engine needs, or whatever. All right. So remember with your options, this is what people are going to see, this is what the code is going to see. All right. And I guess it's the best way that I can think of it. So that's why there's two different things that you set. Now for opening day and HTML5, I just made them the same because that's pretty self-explanatory. I played around a little bit with the one for CSS3 by giving a, a longer description of it in the option tag to say the later, latest version of CSS, CSS3, and the value of it is simply CSS. Okay, So that's what's going to get sent to the server, the CSS. But what I figured in this example is the more understandable terminology would be um, uh, latest version of CSS, CSS3. So let's go and let's, let's watch this work. So let's say I go to search for latest version of CSS, CSS3, and I search Bing. There I go. Notice what's on the query string. What's on the query string is not the full phrase, latest version of CSS, CSS3, but the value of that dropdown. And this brings up an interesting point. Does Bing seem to care 
whether I got the value to it from a text box or whether I got the value to it from a, uh, a, a drop down. No. In this regard, Bing is a lot like Honey Badger. It just doesn't care. All right? It doesn't care how you get the data to it as long as you pass the data somehow. So as long as it gets on the query string called Q, Bing can take it and run with it and do what it needs to do. It doesn't care really how it got there. So the server-side script isn't looking for something specific in a text box or whatever. It's looking for something on the query string with that name. It doesn't matter how it got there. We're going to do the same search or the same kind of thing, except we're going to do it with radio buttons now. All right. Um, so let's go and with that in mind, let's go and let's alter this to include a third version of this form that uses radio buttons. So, radio buttons are also in the input tag. Why they don't have drop downs using the input tag, I don't know. I didn't write this. Send Tim Berners Lee uh, the complaint, uh, courtesy of CERN, which is in Switzerland, I think. I don't know. All right. Input type equals radio. Name equals Q. Value equals opening day. And again, I have to let the user know what it is they're picking when they pick this radio button. So I'll put a label in front of it to say opening day. The next to, next to it will be the radio button. Notice when I do this, all the radio buttons have the same name. That's what makes them act like radio buttons. I'll show you what happens if you don't do that correctly. So notice each of these radio buttons, the name is Q. That's what ties them together and forms a group out of them doesn't matter where they're positioned on the page. You could actually have one on the top of the page, one on the bottom of the page. doesn't matter. All right. Um, the fact that they have the same name is what causes the browser to treat them as a group. So let's go and save this. And I can go in and say, I want to search for the latest version of CSS, CSS3. Search Bing, and there I go. Again, notice that the query string looks identical to the other two times. It passed Q on the query string. All right. Now, notice what happens. Or, I'm going to show you something, and you explain to it. You explain to me why it worked this way. Let's say I typo and type in QQ for the name of that one. All right, so the HTML5 radio button doesn't have the name of Q. It has the name of QQ. All right, let's watch a couple things. Notice, if I pick HTML5, ooh, CSS3 didn't go off. Why not? If I click opening day, it goes off. If I click... I can make those two work, but this button, I can click two of them. It's not considered part of the group. It's treated independently. Now, it's okay to have multiple groups of radio buttons. For example, you could have a radio button for, let's see, here at Lorraine Community College. If you are 
a, um, you know, what age group you're in. All right, you know, there might be under 18, 18 through 21, and so on down the line. So there might be radio buttons for those, and you can select the appropriate radio button. Then there might be a radio button that says, you know, what is your residency status? Inside Lorain County, out of the county, out of the state. All right. So you could have several different radio buttons, but you know, if you do it on purpose, right, and you need to tie them together. If you give them different names, then it's not considered to be the same radio button group, so it's not going to act like radio buttons. In fact, if I do this, notice none of them are selected. If I select HTML5 and do a search, doesn't do the search. Why not? Well, because I didn't give it a Q on the query string. I gave it a QQ on the query string because that's what that was named. All right. So, it's the name that ties them together, not physically where they're located. So they could all be in the same place. They could look like they belong together, but it's the name that really ties them together. All right. And that name should be the name that you want to put on the query string for it. The value should be the value, if that button is selected, the value you're going to put for that query string field. All right. Again, it's important in this class to understand what you need to do on the HTML side to send the proper data over to the server-side script. We don't cover the server-side scripting in this class, but it's important to know the mechanism by which you define in your HTML the form so that it sends to the right script and it calls the right things, the right name on the form. All right. Uh, next week, we will wrap up the other form controls and we will talk a bit about styling forms and we'll talk a little bit about accessibility in forms. All right. We'll see you in lab.